I love meeting companies that are setting the pace. They are showing best practice and they are really distancing themselves from competitors through quality. Well, earlier we met Ian Stone from Acorn Analytics and now we're going to meet his buddy, if that's the expression, Neil Munro. <laughs> Hi, Neil. Nice to you. Yeah. Hiya. <laughs> How you doing, Malcolm? Excellent. Thank you. Okay. So it's great to meet the other half of the podcasting and author duo. Neil, tell us about yourself and what you do at Acorn Analytical. Was that the better half, you said? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hi, yeah. My, my name's Neil Munro. Um, I'm a director for Acorn Analytical Services. Um, a colleague, myself and Ian, um, we both kind of run our Northampton office. So we, I, I kind of started the Northampton office. Um, we're coming into our seventh year of trading. So wow. mm. um, kind of just started with me in the tiny little office. Um, and we, we basically help clients, um, particularly sort of commercial um, clients, manage their asbestos risk. Um, and we do that by providing them with asbestos surveys. Um, we analyze asbestos samples. We undertake um, air, asbestos air monitoring in buildings and basically help um, clients manage the risk from asbestos within their properties. Mm. I, I love the title of your book, Asbestos, the Dark Arts. So yeah. how, did, how did you arrive that title? And why did you feel the need for you and <coughs> Ian to write it? Yeah, it's it's a funny one. Um, there's lots of asbestos um, guidance documents, so government written um, information booklets, uh, mm -hmm. documents that kind of put all the regulations um, into a written format, and they give like explanations of that. However, it's, it's always in kind of a, in industry terminologies. It's always written you've got to really have some some information and some you know some knowledge about asbestos and although asbestos falls into health and safety because there's so many regulations there's so many guidance documents and approved code of practices that's why we get specialists in the industry like ourselves and uh, we, we kind of noticed that there's a bit of a gap between people who are in the industry or with a background you know within compliance or construction but for for duty holders and day-to-day -day business people and normal you know day-to-day -day people really did struggle with um digesting that information because yeah. it's not really written in a format that's kind of in, uh, easy to understand and it does take a bit of explaining a bit of know really in-depth reading into so that's kind of the, the idea around the book was to try and create something that was easy for everyone to kind of get their head around the asbestos regulations mm, okay i got it i know so how has the book helped acorn in its strive to be the authority on asbestos yeah it has really helped um because you know we, we've now got a we've got a product basically that mm we can give to our clients um, and it, basically we use it as a tool to kind of fill in the gaps that, um, you know, where clients are kind of falling down or they're, they're finding it hard to understand a certain element of what, what's required to, to kind of basically prevent people being exposed to asbestos. We can kind of use that book, give that to them, give them the information. And that really just sets us in, the, in a good position of, um, you know, we're the people with the knowledge um, mm. and, we're making it into an easier, an easier format to understand. Yeah, I got you now. Look, we can't move on from the book without mentioning your co-star in role in, in podcasting, uh, as you yes. can imagine. <laughs> yeah, I'm a firm believer in podcasting and, and video casting. Uh, but what inspired you to both to enter into this new way of communicating? Yeah, so really that, that was kind of the, the book came first and then we we're kind of looking for so what's next, you know, how can we how can we great to get this information out to people and and really podcast, you know, I'm a big fan of podcasts. Um, I, you know, I, I, I used to be really into um, audio books, but I've kind of moved away from audio books because mm. I feel that podcasting is more up to date. It's more yeah. live. Yeah. You know, you can react quicker. Um, you know, you can really get to your audience with the information, you know, really quick. Yeah. Um, that's kind of the attraction for us. It was, it was just another format for us to kind of communicate with our clients. Um, and we you kind of use it as a, 
as a as a weekly sort of question and answers for our clients so you know if we get a query from a client that we think oh that's a good that's a good idea that's a good question yeah. we kind of turn that and use that into a um an idea for the podcast so that kind of a, a self-generating um sort of information bank really yeah and and that's kind of moving on to now where when we're initially talking with new clients we can now feed them to the bank of information and that kind of helps educate them along the process um and it's, it's really a good sort of sales and information and, and like you said authority sort of building yeah um, between us and the clients really yeah I, I applaud you on it because you know there is an effort into podcasting people just think you sit down and ramble into the mic there isn't you? <laughs> yeah. yeah no you, you might you might get away with that with a couple of episodes wouldn't you yeah. but it soon dries up so yeah it is it's 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 keeping that sort of fresh content ideas really that's yeah. um and let, let's face it, asbestos is not the uh, the most um, sexy <laughs> subject to talk about. No, but it's the most frightening. I was, I was, um, I, I think I used the word gobsmacked listening to Ian telling me there was 5,000 deaths a year. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no. Um, when, when I first came into the industry, um, the, the peak for asbestos deaths was supposed to be around the year t- uh, 2010. Um, mm. We're obviously ten years down the road from that, and and it's still increasing. Um, they're hoping that we we're kind of at the peak now, but again, we won't know until you know the latest figures come out whether you know it's still increasing or not. Yeah, so yeah, it's it's right. uh, it's it's a lot, isn't it? You see, I I, I must admit, um, I I thought that asbestos problem was a thing of the past. Yeah, that seems not so. So what's it's the current what's the current challenge and concerns in the UK? So just to put it in a, a bit of perspective, um, the UK, we were the biggest users of asbestos. Um, we had the biggest manufacturing plant in the world at one point in this wow. country, which was located in Rochdale. You know, and although asbestos wasn't mined here, it was around the world by UK companies. Um, and you know, we loved the stuff. We were the biggest users of uh, amosite brown asbestos, which went into you know thousands of ceilings, um, pipe insulation, etc. So you know, our history of asbestos is is massive, uh, and and in fact, you know, it's questionable that we've probably got the worst history in in the use of asbestos. So you know, we imported millions of tons of raw asbestos fibre, which was then put into millions of tons of additional materials to make asbestos products, and that legacy, you know, went on for years. And you know, people just don't understand the amount of asbestos that was used to construct buildings, mm. particularly post World War Two, when you know a lot of building was was happened. You know, to sort of compensate for you know what was bombed and also you know it was a big building big big housing campaigns um during that time lots of public buildings were built and the 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 key material that sort of drove all that construction was asbestos so you know we've got a massive legacy of asbestos in this country and we're still living with it and um the regulations have been in place um, to manage asbestos since 2002 um, so we're still trying to educate clients, customers about the, you know, the, the hazards of asbestos that are still present within buildings. Mm. As I said at my opening piece there, you know, I'm totally in admiration of Acon Analytical, how you're setting standards and best practice. But times are tough in the construction sector. And when that happens, shortcuts are often taken. What message would you like to get to people who may take such shortcuts or where should those commissioning works work with people be aware? Yeah, um, it's more of a case of um, employing. When, when it comes to asbestos, it's, it's getting the right contractor, it's getting the right consultancy on board. Um, with, with regards to the consultancy side, so you have to be UCAS accredited to do any testing um, mm. for related services. But it's not a legal requirement to have that accreditation for inspections and surveys. HSC strongly recommend the use of UCAS accredited organisations. So that would be kind of my recommendation is to always employ, you know, don't always go for cheap um, no. with regard to um, employing somebody for asbestos services. 
the accreditation, you know, there's lots involved with that. And, and the, probably the most important is the quality side, the quality control, and it's the audits and, and ensuring that the, the staff members are performing um, to the standards that was required. And those kind of, those, those sort of quality checks may not be in place because they're not externally audited um, for a company that's not accredited. So that would be kind of my my biggest recommendation for anyone that's that's kind of looking to cost cuts is don't go for the cheap non-accredited um, surveyors or, or con contractors. Yeah, especially when it's such a big, big danger. Hey, look, in the past, I've rented a house uh, nearly 20 years ago, I must admit, and later found it had asbestos in the garage roof and in the boiler room. But the estate agent said nothing about it. Uh, and the, or even though they did the a regular inspection uh, during the rental people, isn't that yeah. a lack of duty of care? And do you think there's enough regulation in the marketplace to avoid things like that happening? After all, I'm a typical asbestos unaware member of the public. Yeah, definitely. There's 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 not enough regulation on the domestic side. Um, so, for instance, where you're purchasing a property, mm. um, there's there's no there's no legal requirement to provide that information. Um, there was talk of it happening when um, a few years ago with I think it was the hips um, when you were set buying and selling uh, property yeah, that yeah. never actually came in, into place but that was going to include asbestos information so yeah currently on, on that sort of side of it in a domestic environment there's not as much regulation in place but f definitely from a, a non-domestic um, point of view the regulations are, are in place the issue that we probably face as, as an industry is the regulations are there however the awareness of those the requirements is, is very poor right. um, especially when you when you start funneling down the size of organization down to domestic people so you know top you know as you would expect blue chip mm. companies um, are aware of, of such requirements but as it funnels down to you know the smaller individual businesses and individual members of the public the awareness of the requirement is is, is very low um, and in fact as i mentioned earlier the, the duty to manage has been in place since 2002 it's been enforced um since 2004 so what, what they meant is they what they were bringing this regulation where the duty to manage was where it was going to be a requirement and they gave everyone two years to, to get everything in place so they could comply with regulations. Mm. We're here now in 2020 and we still come, like clients come to us for the first time, never heard about their requirement of asbestos management. So as you can see, you know, we've had over a decade of people not knowing that there's a requirement. So there's a definite yeah. lack in, in communication, lack of funding in, in getting that message out there um, from government level really. Right. That's, that's frightening, isn't it? Because it's such a big, big, big problem. I'm mighty impressed, as I say, with both the professionalism and the human approach, you know, telling it like it is of Acorn Analytical. What do you think summarises your business culture? Um, we, we, we're trying to, trying to do stuff differently. Core, we, you know, part of our core focus is, is innovation. And, you know, we, we're trying to do um, stuff a, a bit different, um, trying to use new technologies and that's kind of at the forefront of our, our, our kind of spearheading the what we're doing so like I said with the book the podcast um, we, we, we're big on videos and um, we find videos explaining um, mm. information to to clients is really good and that's kind of at, at the core of our you know our core focus our core values is trying trying to get that information in, in a modern innovative way um, out to our customers and clients excellent yeah look you personally are very experienced in selling over a good number of years you know i actually started my sales career in northampton many many years ago really? yeah for a company called mattel do you think that selling will have to change in what's being called the new normal? And if so, how? For example, I know that your sales style is currently face-to-face, -face, um, consulted one, but will that change? Will a larger element include virtual selling or something else? Yeah, definitely. I, I think um, prior to, to the, the, the current climate, um, we were trying, we were already doing 
um, and trying to go down the kind of virtual because the tech, we've got all the technology that's that's uh, available to us and um, it it was always met with a bit of um, skepticism and I think this is really this is going to change um, mm. the way that people do think about um, communicating really that's that's yeah. what it is. And do you need to drive 200 miles for a meeting when, you know, you, at a click of a button, you can have, as we're doing now, communicating um, equally as, as good? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I quite, I quite agree. My car's done 140 miles in the last three months. It's ridiculous, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah, especially when I was paying for 20,000 miles a year on the lease. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mileage is good this year, that's for yeah. sure. As I said, I love the way Acorn Analytical is focused on professionalism and quality. I picked up one thing that you offer, which is a certificate for reoccupation. What's one of those? Yes. Okay, so um, when um, there's, there's different types of asbestos works, um, most works have to be done by a licensed asbestos contractor and the license is granted from the HC, so the health and safety executive. During those works, um, before the area can be finished, handed back to the client, that area has to be independently checked and verified that it's safe for reoccupation. So mm -hmm. that's basically an independent co company um, has to come in to verify that the contractor has one completed the works correctly and to working towards their method statement and that it's then safe for um, the building owner or occupants to come in and reoccupy that area. Right. And that kind of in involves a, what's called a four stage clearance. So uh, our, one of our consultant analysts will come and check the area, check the waste routes, um, check the contractors paperwork on site. They'll then inspect the area to make sure that there's no dust and debris left in there. Um, they'll undertake some air monitoring within that enclosure and then they'll sort of oversee and inspect the area as the enclosure is taken down and then issue the certificate of recuperation. Excellent. Very yeah. brief view of that service. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, before we move on to the next question, I just remind people I'm showing the finger in the right way and pointing to your URL, the website. Pop along there. I think you'll be totally amazed about how uh, committed. Acorn Analytical are to um, setting the standards. What, what concerns you regarding the asbestos question in the near future? For example, how will Brexit and the other crises that we've got like uh, recession and climate yeah. change and that um, have on the horizon impact the work that you do? Yeah, I think it, with a lot of things, um, it comes down to money is the, is the biggest mm. threat to yeah. any industry. Um, and you know, we, we, we've, we're an industry which is backed by regulation. Um, so there is legal requirements to do, you know, most elements of what we do. Um, however, they, we, when you're talking about budgets, um, as I sort of spoke about earlier about the, you know, we're, we're decades into the duty to manage. Um, yeah. and, and the reason why that's been so mis, um, uh, uncomplied with is because of the, the money that's been spent on advertising the requirements. Mm. Um, and we're not just talking about GDPR, you know, we, we're not talking about data information. We're talking about something that could potentially kill people. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. I, I really do, do worry about the, the kind of the money that's being spent on advising people. And I don't know. Yeah. Maybe Brexit could, uh, could, uh, could go one or two ways. I suppose, um, you know, it could have less money spent on it, or it could have more. So, yeah, there's it's, it's a big unknown, definitely, um, currently in the industry on, on what's going to happen. Yeah. However, the, the one good thing is, you know, the UK has got one of the best health and safety records in the world. Mm. And, and a lot of the European regulation was kind of based on our UK original laws. So, you know, take that with a bit of confidence that, you know, we, we're not going to let that go, hopefully. Yeah, and I just, as I say, I love the way you're setting the standards. So, Neil, I've got a final question for you. You can put your dark arts hood on, if you like, you know, for, for this. If I gave you three wishes for the future regarding your profession, what would they be? Hmm, good one. Um, probably leading off the back of the last question, really. Um, I'd like to say, see more, you know, more money spent on 
raising the awareness about asbestos requirements, protecting yeah. people, protecting, especially in schools. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of campaign for asbestos in, in schools because, you know, I think it's estimated approximately 78% of schools contain asbestos. So, you know, I'd really like some sort of information uh, and some money spent on that. Um, more kind of maybe moving towards a mandatory accreditation for all asbestos services. Um, you know, that would be really sort of good because it would make sure there is a, a level playing field and people procuring asbestos services always know what they're going to get. Um, and probably again comes down to budget. I'd like to see more money spent on policing, um, especially. Yeah. yeah. Uh, We've got all this stuff in place, however, it's it's non-complied with on a day-to-day basis. Um, and if if you know the government could push some more money into that, that great. Yeah, Neil Munro of Acon Analytical Services. Keep doing what you're doing because you're doing great. Thank you very much indeed for your time today. Brilliant. Thanks, Malcolm.